Good morning. My name is Gaston Alonso. I am the director of the Ethel R. Wolf Institute for the Humanities. And thank you for joining us, those who are joining us online. And thank you especially to those who have braved the storms out there uh, to make it this uh, morning to join us in person. You're in for a treat. Uh, a treat and a very, I think, important lesson about the value of scholarship that is engaged and reveals the world to us. Uh, to start us this morning, let me introduce the Dean of the School of Humanities and Social Science, uh, Philip Napoli. Good morning, everybody, and I want to say thank you once again for coming. Um, I want to uh, thank you, especially to Paul Ortiz, our special thank guest. You, thank you to Professor Alonzo and the staff at the Wolf Institute for arranging this morning's event. This is a, a shameless prompt uh, for the HSS Expo, which begins Monday, the 15th of April, and runs all through the day in this space and on the 16th. Uh, students from HSS will be presenting all of their kinds of work, whether it's from communications, arts, and sci arts sciences, and disorders. Um, on their research, uh, people in classics are participating, people from the history department, and my very own class, History 1101, will be here uh, bright and early on Monday, the 15th, to talk about their experiences collecting oral histories. And with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Pastor Tom. Thank you, Bill. Um, and then now I want to introduce uh, to you uh, the director of one of our sponsors, um, the wonderful Brooklyn College Center for uh, Teaching and Learning. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, it's so great to see you all here bright and early. Uh, so, first of all, I want to welcome Paul Ortiz to our campus. Thank, thank you. you. It's an honor to have you here. Um, and I want to thank Gaston for inviting me because I always love to collaborate with Gaston. So, of course, when he asked me with the CTL co sponsored event, I didn't have to think twice. So, uh, so thank you. Um, and I just, um, you know, at the Center for Teaching and Learning, of course, our mission is about pedagogy and improving pedagogy and how can we. Um, how could, you know, what's, how can we be the best teachers that we can be? And so I was thinking about oral history um, in terms of pedagogy, because of course it's important on its own, um, but how does it relate to our teaching? Um, so I think the easy, the first thing that came, comes to mind for me with oral history when it comes to teaching is that, you know, we're really all drawn to stories, right, from the time that we're little till, now, I mean, I'm in a writing group on and off, and every time we do peer review of our, you know, we, we submit drafts to each other, we read each other's drafts, it's always the ones with the interviews and the oral histories that everyone loves. Oh, I want more of that, I want more of that. So, um, stories have real power to engage us and to engage our students and to kind of get them excited. Um, and, you know, sometimes that can be difficult, but I think oral history uh, has a lot of power to engage um, in the classroom. Um, the second thing that I think is important about oral history is um, it gives students real agency. Um, and I participate in the listening project um, in some of my classes, and I teach architectural history. Um, buildings don't talk, but the people who use them definitely do. So, um, uh, and I see that when my students sit down to interview the family members or friends or their bosses or whoever it is, they you know, they have to write the questions, they think about the problem, and they get really engaged, and they see that they can write history, and that history isn't something that is just on the pages of their textbooks and the articles, that they're part of this process. And I think that's really so crucial in, um, you know, in just in teaching and showing our students that history is not something static, that is constantly evolving. Um, which brings me to my next point, and that is, I think that, um, you know, oral history and listening to people's stories, of course, it's about inclusivity, right? And opening up, breaking down boundaries. Um, when students are talking to, again, their friends, family, um, you know, they're telling like vernacular stories. They're telling stories that are not necessarily known. They're telling, they're amplifying voices that are not always listened to. So um, that's so crucial. I think in, um, again, in teaching our students about you know, what is history um, and who writes it and whose history gets written. And they can be a part of writing histories that might not be so widely known. Um, and then the last thing I think that I, perhaps is the most important, um, especially in the age that we're living in, and I'm sure this has been said already this week, but um, when we 
when we do oral history, when we interview people, when we write oral histories, we are humanizing people who may be different than us. And I think that studying oral history is a way of humanizing the other, right? That like when you meet an individual, you talk to them as an individual, um, even if they're part of a group that you know you might not know, or maybe you have certain preconceived ideas about, you meet them where they are, and you listen to their stories, and you see them for who they are, um, you know, the singular. And I think that, of course, at Brooklyn College, you know, we're about diversity, right? Um, and to me, what that means is, you know, everyone always says that, what that means to me is I go into my classroom and I have students from everywhere, from all walks of life, from all kinds of backgrounds, and we come together and we learn. And in the classroom, that's our space where we learn. And I think that with oral history, um, that is an opportunity for us also to come together, just to come together in a space and talk to each other and really listen to each other. Um, and I think that if we listen to each other, you know, of course, that that's ultimately what brings us together. So um, without further ado, I guess I'll, I don't know again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your words, for your support for Chess Week. This is the second year we're partnering together, and above all, for all that the CPL does for our college. So thank you. Now, the other sponsor of this morning's event is the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida, which today's speaker, Chess scholar Paul Ortiz, has directly since 2008. Um, the program has received uh, numerous awards, including the Oral History Associations at Stetson Kennedy Award. Um, for outstanding achievements using oral history to create a more just world. It's also received the Society of American Archivists uh, Diversity Award for programs that pursue of community knowledge and local voices. And in 2020, after external review of the program, the Doris Duke Charitable Trust concluded that, quote, the program's social justice research methodologies are the focus of scholars and oral history programs across the globe. Right? Um, so we're in for a treat, and we're in for a, uh, a lesson from one of the leading oral historians in the country. Um, just three quick points, and I will turn over the microphone. First, if you're a student and you did not sign in on the way in, please make sure you sign in on the way out. Second, this event is being recorded and it will, uh, it's being live streamed. Uh, and I know uh, people in Florida are joining us. Um, we get to be national. Uh, our recording of the event will be posted on the Wolf Institute's YouTube channel. Um, and next, the last thing I'll say is at the door you receive the program with the rest of our HES Week uh, programming. We're in event number five. We have three more. We do put our head scholars to work. Uh, so I hope that you will join us to continue this conversation uh, later this afternoon for an event on uh, union power, uh, the role of academic labor unions, and then tomorrow morning for an event on the history of freedom struggles, and then for Paul's Has Memorial Lecture tomorrow at 5.30 right here. We'll have prose, we'll have music, and we'll have Paul. And with that, I'll turn over the microphone to you. All right. Thank you, Chris Alonso, for the kind introduction. And so exciting to be with oral history scholars this morning. Uh, I understand from Dean Phil that you all, many of you, have been doing oral history interviews. Um, you are well on your way to becoming outstanding oral historians. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't give props to the Oral History Association uh, which some of us are members of in this room. Now, the Oral History Association, we were talking about this um, a couple of days ago. Uh, I am involved in a lot of different professional academic associations, and by far the Oral History Association is the coolest um, because it, it, it does include academics, folks like, like me, but it also does include um, K through 12 teachers, uh, independent scholars, museum professionals, uh, activists, uh, organizers, and people really from all walks of life. And the Oral History Association uh, is a very inclusive, welcoming place for folks who do oral history. So 
I really encourage you, as you, you move forward in your oral history work, to check us out um, and maybe actually join the Oral History Association. We have yearly meetings. Our next annual meeting, I believe, is in Cincinnati, if I'm not I'm mistaken. Uh, we'll have a chance to go to the Underground Railroad Museum. And I talked yesterday a little bit about one of the current projects that the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program is doing actually with descendants of the Underground Railroad, both conductors and freedom seekers. Thank you so much, Carl. Can we get the, the screen turned on too? Yeah. I, I should know how to do that, but um, there you go. Okay. okay, thank you very much. So I wanted to talk this morning about oral history, especially in this really crucial time that we live in. Um, and the, the talk has to do with, well, the title uh, is Bearing Witness, uh, Taking Action in an Age of Rising Fascism, Oral History in the Field and in the Classroom. And in order to, to get to that topic, I was thinking about oral history practice in the 1920s and 1930s especially, because that was also a period of rising fascism and totalitarianism. And what better person to think about at, at the outset than Stetson Kennedy? And before I get to kind of the more contemporary moment, let me take you back to the 1930s and talk a little bit about Stetson Kennedy. So Stetson Kennedy is considered to be really one of the early kind of modern oral history practitioners. He was born and raised uh, near Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, he became a close collaborator. Um, how many of you are familiar with a great writer and intellectual by the name of Zora Neale Hurston? Okay. So Stetson Kennedy actually worked with Zora Neale Hurston in the 1930s, and what they were doing was they were traveling throughout Florida together, very unusual, um, uh, an Anglo man or a white man, we, Anglo was the term we used for white individuals where I grew up, uh, traveling with an African-American woman in Florida in the 1930s, pretty unheard of. And the other unheard of thing was they did oral history interviews um, and recorded folklore, uh, uh, recorded stories, poetry, not from affluent or even middle class folks based in academia, but actually recorded turpentine workers' songs, you know, railroad workers' songs. And if you've ever had a chance to read Zora Neale Hurston, you're blessed. Their Eyes Were Watching God is one of the, is, I think it's one of the top 10 novels in the entire American uh, history canon. Uh, and it's based in Florida. It's based on a true story. And the thing that Zora Neale Hurston and Stetson Kennedy shared was their concern with working class life, the life of migrant workers, uh, phosphate miners, uh, farm workers, uh, people who lived, to paraphrase the Reverend Howard Thurman, with their backs against the wall. They had a faith, both Hurston and Stetson Kennedy, that working class people had the types of wisdom that the society really needed to fight fascism, especially in the 1930s. And so for Stetson Kennedy, oral history was really a political act. And I wanted to also share with you that um, people don't often mention this about Stetson. I've heard a lot of people give talks about it. He was very close with, with Stetson Turkle, um, a lot of the great writers and oral historians of the 20th century. Uh, Stetson was also, I shouldn't say this here at Brooklyn College, Stetson was a college dropout. <laughs> shouldn't say that, but um, he was actually at the University of Florida, my university, in the 1930s uh, when I just started teaching there. That was uh, just to see if you're awake. <laughs> I, I'm not. I'm not that old, y'all. I, I did just turn sixty, but I was not teaching in the 1930s. Anyway, but Stetson Kennedy was in in the University of Florida in the 1930s, and he dropped out because, other than a course he took with Marjorie Kennan Rawlings, who's another writer uh, to become familiar with, who wrote *The Yearling*, another magnificent story about a family who who lives literally with their backs up against the wall. Uh, in Florida, small farmers, other than taking the course <clears throat> with Marjorie Rollins, he said, look, <clears throat> the Great Depression was going on. Industrial unionism, you know, strikes, mass movements, and this fight against fascism was happening. And I just decided that 
college was kind of boring, and I wanted to get out in the world. And what he did was he became the supervisor for the Florida Works Progress Administra uh, Administration, the WPA. How many of you have studied the New Deal? You know about the, the, the WPA? I mean, Brooklyn College has an incredible history, by the way, with the WPA. So Stetson actually directed the Writers' Unit in Florida, and he directed oral histories, and he, he would assign people to go out and do interviews, and he himself did many of those interviews, in fact. And he also became a lifelong anti-fascist, pro-labor uh, activist in Florida. Stetson never really taught. He was never, a, uh, well, he did teach. Stetson was never, I should say that, he was never a professor at a university. He did teach oral history periodically at the University of North Florida. We have some of his syllabi. Uh, we've talked about this in the Oral History Association. He had a really fascinating way of teaching oral history. But I wanted to read a um, uh, just a couple of paragraphs from a foreword I wrote to a recent book about Stetson, a, a collection of essays that were recently discovered um, uh, that Stetson wrote between the Great Depression uh, and his collaborations with Studs Terkel, another great oral historian. And I'm just reading this because it gives Stetson's definition of fascism, which I think is very timely today even though he's giving the, the essay, or he's giving the definition uh, in a 1940s essay that he wrote titled, Labor is the First Fascist Target. And this is what he said, or I'll, I'll read this, the two paragraphs. At a moment when his beloved Florida is becoming known for banning books and ideas that challenge inequality, Stetson's essays on power and resistance have assumed tremendous importance. In a piece written shortly after the end of World War II and published in this anthology, Kennedy wrote, quote, In my years inside homegrown fascist outfits, it is my conclusion that fascism is not likely to come to America in either a Klan robe or a Columbia shirt. It appears to me that a large measure of fascism is already here, all wrapped up in red, white, and blue profiteering union busting, witch hunting, and war mongering. Stetson Kennedy's 1940s essay, Labor is the First Fascist Target, you have to remember this is a guy who grew up in a family of Ku Klux Klan leaders, not just members, but people who led the Klan in Florida, which had the most, the strongest, most uh, vicious pro-paramilitary uh, clan in the entire country. Florida had uh, African Americans suffered the highest per capita lynching rate in the country in Florida. Florida was notorious for anti-black, for anti-Jewish, for anti-Muslim, for anti-Catholic violence for generations. That was what Florida was known for before the civil rights movement changed everything in Florida and transformed the state. But Stetson is writing here in the 1940s, again, growing up in a Klan environment. And actually, he one of the things, many things he did in his career was he actually infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan. He pretended to be a Klansman to get inside of the organization to expose their crimes, their racketeering, their corruption, their, their anti-black violence. And one of the stories he would tell us, Bill, at the Oral History Association annual meetings, we'd at, we, we would ask him to tell the story because it was such a powerful story, even though we had heard it before, we loved to hear Stetson tell the story. And the story he told was he spent a, a, a several months infiltrating the Florida Ku Klux Klan, meticulously cataloged the crimes they were committing, and drove up to Atlanta to the regional FBI office to deliver this list of sordid crimes to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The very next day, the head of the Klan in Florida called Stetson in for a meeting and said, Stetson, we have a rat. And if we find out who that informer is, we're going to kill him. And Stetson realized really quickly that the FBI was involved in the Ku Klux Klan. Okay? So eventually he left and he went to France for a while, kind of, you know, till things cooled down. 
But this is how we define fascism, kind of going on with it. In this piece, labor is the first fascist target. Stetson defined fascism as, quote, nothing more or less than gang rule by the greedy, which, quote, has found that in order to establish its dictatorship, it has first got to put labor in a straitjacket of regimenting laws. And he's looking here to fascist Italy in 1922 and to Nazi Germany in 1933, because when those, when fascists and Nazis take power, the first institutions that they crush are independent trade unions. You cannot have an independent working class movement and Nazism together. They're, they're, they're opposed 100%. You can't have independent trade unions. Just like talking, you couldn't have a teacher's union in Florida and fascists in full power. The first thing the fascists would do is they would try to dismantle or destroy the teacher's union. And so this is not a laboratory problem. This is something Stetson and millions of people experienced in the U.S. and Europe, um, in Italy and Germany, especially in the 1920s and 30s. Stetson observed that, quote, in the South, where he grew up, Christian America has been the center of this activity, but in the nation as a whole, the most powerful force working this end has been the National Association of Manufacturers, or the NAM, which since 1903 has been poisoning the American public mind with the best financed and most far-reaching anti-labor propaganda of all time. Stetson's bluntness in identifying the ruling class's investment in convict labor, voter suppression, and Jim Crow contrasts sharply with the recent writings of those blaming the reemergence of these draconian institutions on an abstraction called right-wing populism. Stetson never used that, that phraseology, right-wing populism, um, in any of the writings that I could ever find by him. So I want to switch over thinking about the Great Depression and how the works of people like Stetson Kennedy and Zora Neale Hurston helped set us on this trajectory of what you are all doing this semester, which is you're interviewing people, I think by and large that you know, right? I mean, that's really the, the assignment that you've been doing. Um, you're not necessarily interviewing like the rich and wealthy and famous types of folks. You're interviewing people like us, you know, like, like ordinary kind of people. And that's really uh, just a precious practice that people like Stetson Kennedy and Zora Neale Hurston um, established for us that we take for granted. The first time I remember, um, even before I read Their Eyes Were Watching God, which if you haven't read it, by the way, you should read it by, by, by Hurston. Before I read the book, I remember... I wandered into the Library of Congress, and the Library of Congress had just set up the the Phil the the the, uh, was the folklore unit, okay, and they didn't really even have an office at that point. And I walked into this room in the middle of the Library of Congress as a grad student at Duke University, and there's a big wooden table, and uh, Jessica and Sharon, this is going to blow you away. It was just full of cassette tapes. Most of them didn't even have cases, right? And so I walk over to this desk. There's no one on duty. I think Archie Green has just done all the work to get this going. And I pick up this cassette tape, and it says, Zora Neale Hurston, Florida Forest. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to this. Now, some of you, when I say cassette tape, are thinking, God, you must be talking about the 20th century. Uh, they, in fact, there was a Radio Shack recorder on the table. I plugged it in. I put the cassette tape in. And there was Zora Neale Hurston's amazing voice. And she was talking to a group of African-American railway men, as we call them. My, my grandfather's railway men for the Southern Pacific in Houston, Texas. And she was talking to these men. They were going back and forth. And they were teaching her the songs that they sang to make their work livable and, and doable because they had to work in this, you know, 105, 110 degree heat in South Florida to literally build the state 
again, all the things that, that when I moved to Florida in Hawaii, we took for granted. Oh, there's railroad lines. Oh, isn't that great? But we, we, we don't always think, well, who built those things? Hurston wanted to remind us who built those things, okay? Who built the infrastructure of this country? Who built this building? You know, who constructed this magnificent campus in the 30s and later? And just listening to this, I was just mesmerized because Hurston would sing a couple stanzas, and one of them, uh, one of the forms, one of the genres was a track lining song. A track lining song is where the men would pick up these several ton ties or, um, and, 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 and tracks and then pick them up in unison, lay them down. And then they had pile driving songs. They had songs for every kind of motion in building that railroad that you can imagine. But Hurston would sing a stanza or two, and the men would tell her if she had got it right or not. And if she got it wrong, they would correct her post takes. And they said, and they would always refer to her as ma'am. No ma'am or yes ma'am. You, you, you got this right, but you need to, <clears throat> to, to, to kind of tighten this, this part up as well. And I'm sharing this with you because this is a kind of, um, I mean, we call this sometimes folklore, but I argue this is also a part really connected to oral history in learning stories, but also songs, learning poetry. And those are some of the things that Zora Neale Hurston and Stetson taught us in the 1930s. And again, I'm just so impressed by the fact that they really keyed in on working class people. They were not that interested in middle class people. I mean, nothing against middle class people. I think we're kind of, I, I think we're kind of interesting sometimes. But there was a reason, I, I believe, that Hurston and Kennedy established an oral history and a folklore practice with the poorest, hardest working workers in the society, with farm workers, with timber workers. Hurston doesn't go into an office environment in the 1930s and ask, hey, sing me your office songs. Uh, I'm sure they existed, actually. You know, people in offices sing sometimes. You know, even your professors sing, by the way. Or at least we listen to music, okay? Um, let me switch to the contemporary moment because now we've been, as we've been talking this week, we're also facing a time, uh, we live in a time of rising fascism. We live in a time when genocide is being um, displayed in real time. It's not something that's, that's distant. There's a new technologies of social media that really allow us to hone in on what's happening. I would argue that during this time, uh, and again, I think this aligns with your, your class project, that doing oral histories during these crisis moments is more important than ever. Storytelling, grounding, getting people together who normally are not seen as people who normally get together in, in, in spaces. But this is what storytelling and oral history can do and I think should do. It seems unusual in retrospect that Stetson Kennedy, who grew up in the Ku Klux Klan, ends up becoming an expert in African American history. It seems a little odd in retrospect, maybe that Zora Neale Hurston, who is a graduate student at Columbia University, ends up doing this incredible field work with ordinary working class people in South Florida, in Haiti, in Mexico, and other places. But this is what oral history does. It gets us off campus. It gets us into moments and places that we may not be comfortable with, that we probably are not comfortable with. Um, there's nothing in Zora Neale Hurston's history or, 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 or upbringing that leads one to believe that she'd be sitting with a group of black railway men in 1933 learning their songs. That's an odyssey and journey that she had to take very willfully. And uh, some people said, why are you doing that? Why would you talk to those people? They don't have anything to share. They're, they're not even literate, most of them. And in response, they have more wisdom in their communities than we'll ever know. And that's why she wrote the way she wrote. Okay? And so today, in oral history practice, I wanted to kind of zoom in on this because we've had great discussions in Gainesville, Florida, um, and around what's happening, the, the, the latest Israeli uh, occupation and assault in Gaza, 
But what we've tried to do in Gainesville is to bring people together. Uh, I'm a member of, of Veterans for Peace. I mentioned earlier, I'm a third generation US military combat veteran. Many of us are in dialogue with, uh, and have been in dialogue uh, with comrades in Gaza over the generations. We have sponsored many peace delegations to Gaza, to the occupied territories. We have linked up with IDF veterans, uh, Israeli Defense Force veterans who are also anti-war. Um, this dialogue, though, is a little different because it did not take place in Gaza. <clears throat> it did not take place in Israel. It took place in Gainesville, Florida, <clears throat> in a Palestinian-owned uh, establishment. Leila Fakuri is a former student of mine. She's an incredible uh, a business person, a recent graduate who already has her own business. But her family grew up in Palestine and were dispossessed. And so she uses storytelling to talk about her family's histories. And the people in this frame, these wonderful people, and let me see if I can figure out how to move this, as they're telling their story, they're, they're talking to us about where they're from. So I'm standing, Layla's in the center, and I'll uh, guess what, I'll share these slides with you so you guys can look at this at your leisure. I'm, I won't read this completely. But I'm standing next to um, Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons. This is another kind of unusual, um, wonderful kind of thing because Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons grew up in Memphis, Tennessee in the 19, or early 1960s, became active in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Civil Rights Movement in the Deep South, and then worked for 23 years with the American Friends Service Committee. And that's where she became intimately involved and, and interacted uh, with Palestinians, with Israelis, and Hebron, and other places, and in Gaza, uh, uh, in, and other parts of North Africa and the Middle East as well. But this was a storytelling session this was a time for Layla to talk about her life, her family uh, in Gaza. This was a time for Zahar to talk about her life growing up in the civil rights movement, but how she later connected to Gaza and to the Palestinian freedom struggle and connected between the black freedom struggle and the Palestinian freedom struggle. Um, and the wonderful lady to, that is sitting just to the left of Layla, let me get this right, is Alana Bakal. She is an 85, she describes herself as an 85-year-old Iraqi Jew, born in Baghdad, and immigrated to Israel as a refugee when she was 12 years old. Uh, Alana lived for two decades in Israel before immigrating to the United States. She also lived in South Africa for a year and a half and participated in activism against apartheid. She's a volunteer with the Palestinian Aid Society, the International Women's Peace Service, and the Fellowship of Reconciliation. She has participated in peace delegations to the West Bank, Gaza, Iraq, and most recently to Turkey to volunteer with Syrian refugees. Now, I can't play for you any excerpts of, of, of the storytelling that, that takes place here. Um, it may be on YouTube, though, Phil. Uh, you may be able to find this. Um, I hope it was recorded at some point. Because the storytelling was incredible. And as an oral historian, again, my job was to like keep my mouth closed. I was simply the moderator, the facilitator of this, these discussions. Um, I've never been to Gaza. I'm not Palestinian. I wasn't in the civil rights movement in the early 60s. But I studied those connections. And to hear the, the, these incredible um, activists tell their stories um, was really um, a bonding and just enlightening and powerful experience. You see the, the chair of, of the a newly formed Jewish Voice for Peace chapter wearing a not in her name uh, t-shirt there. Um, and again, storytelling is the thing that really brought people together who normally may not get together. Okay, this is one of the great things about oral history. It's a democratic practice. And I would argue that it becomes especially important during these moments of crisis during the 1930s, during the 1940s, and now. Because what, what, care, what brings those two eras together, historically speaking, is these are both moments of rising reactionary power. Not just in the United States, 
not just in Europe, but in fact, all over the world. I've given so many talks in recent um, years, and especially in the last year or two, on the title, uh, Gaston, is either Democracy in Crisis, I think I've given about 15 of those. <laughs> and I've given those on three, one, two, three, four different continents, thanks to Zoom. Because everywhere, the idea of democracy, the idea that we can come together and talk to each other, work out our problems, control our own institutions, have independent unions, have wonderful, vibrant public schools that, by the way, are funded well, so that there's some level of equality and diversity, those ideas are under siege, not just here, but throughout the entire world. So again, this is why what you're doing in oral history, you're learning how to get conversations going. You're learning how to get people to, uh, talking. Especially important, you're learning how to listen. That is a, it, it's, it's a distinctive characteristic about reactionary fascist movements, is that leaders come up with solutions to every problem. When President Trump was inaugurated in 2016, I, I read a speech, or 17, thank you. Um, what did he say? In fact, I watched it. I had students there because we had Samuel Proctor, oral history students there, Phil, actually doing interviews with people because my students wanted to know, uh, Professor Ortiz, uh, how could Donald Trump get elected president after all our society has been through? Why would so many people support the man? I said, we're going to do what oral historians do. We're going to outfit a team to go to Washington, D.C., and we're going to go, we're going to be at the inaugural. And then we're going to go to the Women's March the day after. And we're going to do interviews and we're going to talk to people. My students were fascinated by this group called um, Latinos for Trump. Okay? And so they, they kept asking me, because I teach Latinx history, how could there be such a group? And I said, make it a research problem. Talk to them. Ask them why there are Latinos for Trump. Okay? And so they went, and, and the interviews are fascinating. There's, some of them are on our YouTube website at the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Um, and it was really edifying to see these, the, our students tackle these very difficult interviews. But the point I have about reactionaries and listening, and, and this is where you get really into tyrannical practice, when Donald Trump was elected, he, his, the big portion of his speech was, I'm elected, that solved all the problem. And he literally says that in his inauguration speech. That's the end of it. There is no more debate because I'm the maximum leader and I have the answers to your problems and you don't have to worry anymore. I got you covered. And uh, if you have any problems, it's the fault of those others, the Mexicans, the immigrants, the illegals, uh, the MAGA movement in Florida, profoundly anti-Muslim, profoundly anti-Semitic, profoundly anti-immigrant. We send uh, policemen to, to the U.S.-Texas border to do what? We're not anywhere near the U.S.-Texas border, but our leaders are telling us that you're, if you have a problem, Professor Ortiz, if you're having a hard time uh, ma making your mortgage or your, your street looks a little run down, blame it on the immigrant. Blame it on the other. Blame it on the squatter. Blame it on the poor person. Again, these are, dis these are distinctive characteristics of fascist reactionary movements. Blame the other. This has come up during this week of discussions quite often. And again, the power of world history is to pierce that othering. Because instead of a society of strangers, and this is the other distinctive thing about fascist totalitarian societies, these are societies of strangers, because you're either in, you're either one of the, the, the folk, okay, think of Nazi Germany, this whole pretend thing about being Aryans, okay, you're either in that group, or you're the other, and the other you will be dealt with, you'll be put in isolation, you'll be ghettoized, you'll be incarcerated, you'll be tyrannized. You have to be with the, with the in-group. That is another characteristic of a fascist 
society in a rising fascism is the othering of people. We can't come together to solve our problems because, well, we already have the answer. Our problems are created by the other. And who the other is depends on where you are in, in the world, you know, the, the time frame, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let me just go through a couple kind of movement slides, because again, we've been talking about mass action. And I love doing oral histories in the middle of social movements, because they're just talking to people. That's how I actually got my start in oral history, was not in the classroom. But believe it or not, we didn't have oral history when I was an undergrad. <laughs> you probably didn't either. If you did, you're very lucky. You know, you're very lucky to have the oral, this Bill teaching this wonderful oral history class now. But when I was a student, we just didn't have that. I learned how to interview actually through radio. Um, I had a lay, international labor affairs radio program, and I would interview people. I would especially interview labor organizers. In the late 80s and early 90s, that was, it's not like it is now, where labor is on the march and it's very popular. Labor was under siege in the late 80s and early 90s. You know, we lose about a union per day. Uh, and the phrase that I grew up with as a, le a younger labor activist was hold the line. That was the best we could, we, we could hope to accomplish. It wasn't like change things or shake things up or revolution. It was hold the line. In other words, try to keep things from getting worse than they already are. Rising poverty rates, rising homeless rates, disinvestment in public institutions. Um, and I think CUNY goes from being a free free tuition system to uh, what what year was the the did they bring in the charging for tuition? 75, 75, 75. Yeah, yeah. This is a time. This is a tough time. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to share a couple of these with you, or a few of these, and then I'll kind of wrap up and, uh, and take questions. But the and I won't read the the entire narratives again. But I just love to talk to people who are in motion, who are in these movements. These are inherently, you know, anti-fascist movements. A labor movement is a democratizing movement. It's a movement, in this case, in the central coast of California, primarily uh, Latino, Middle Eastern, working class, poor white workers who join unions to counterbalance the power of their very powerful employers. And so if you look at the narratives here of what people are saying, you know, we may not be professors or executives, uh, but all workers deserve decent wages, respect, and opportunities to move up. That's basic. That's democracy one-on-one. -on -one. If you don't have that, then you don't have democracy. And I would argue as a labor historian, you can judge the health of a society. You can judge whether or not it's a healthy democratic society by the state of its independent trade unions. And if those unions are under siege or they're collapsing or they're, or they're in, in, in peril or jeopardy, that's a society that is losing democracy. Okay, so um, I talked about this narrative yesterday. It was so striking to me. Uh, Jolande Lopez, great organizer. We consider that as workers without faces, we are the ghosts who clean but never have any type of recognition. What we do with oral histories is so precious because we're giving recognition. Um, we don't use that phrase, giving voice to the voiceless anymore, but we're providing platforms for people who normally don't, maybe not have a, uh, don't have a platform, okay? This is an illustration of that point. When you have these movements, and a big movement is always a cross-class movement. There's no such thing as just a middle-class movement or just a working-class movement. And the labor movement, as I experienced it when I was a professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz, was one of these cross-class movements. There were many students involved uh, with the workers. Now, some of the students had connections to the workers. Some of the students were actually children or grandchildren of some of the workers. But being a college student and, uh, in, in UC Santa Cruz is very different than being a cafeteria worker at the same institution. And what I love about following social movements and storytelling and, and, and narrative is how code switching happens. So very often the quote unquote educated people 
the middle class folks um, like me or like us end up listening and the workers speak. And this is a great example. One of my former students who's holding a bullhorn for one of the leaders of the AFSCME local um, at my campus when I taught at UC Santa Cruz. And then after the speak out, which was a struggle for a dollar an hour per more in wages. Wow, that's the revolution, right? A dollar an hour per more. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Just like they're sweating now, I heard this, these uh, McDonald's is in California going nuts because workers are getting, what, uh, the $20 an hour? I mean, if you have lived in California, $20 an hour is actually not that much money. Um, but it's, it's, it's an accomplishment. Okay, it's a democratizing accomplishment. But in these cases where you often would have people who kind of take middle class educated people take a step back and have workers at the forefront. And again, I think that's really good oral history practice. Uh, let me share with you another place where I saw this in, in action recently. I was doing research at the National Archives in Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago working with Ibram Kendi on a project. And they had uh, a poor people's campaign. There, there's uh, Reverend William Barber from North Carolina has restarted Dr. King's and the SCLC's famous poor people's campaign. And they had a great rally in March in DC and I just happened to be in DC when this was, was going, it was so cool. And they called in delegations from all 50 states and all of the delegations of working class people, and that's how they that's how they identify people, would get a certain amount of time, I think about five or eight minutes on this platform. And in the back you saw the nation's capital. And they got to speak their truth. And from the plain states, there are a lot of Native American uh, uh, individuals, uh, there are Asian Americans, people from the Appalachians, people from all over the country. But the rule that Reverend Barber and the Poor People's Campaign set, I thought was really fascinating. And as an oral historian, I was 100% in, in favor of it. Rule number one was no politicians were allowed to speak. <laughs> only working class people, okay? No politicians allowed to speak. And only two academics the whole day were allowed to speak. One of them was Cornell West. And obviously he's a great speaker. Okay, it's not like listening to someone like me and you're like, oh God, when's he gonna stop talking, right? Um, but the point again, and, and, and kind of wrapping up here and getting back to Zora Neale Hurston and Stetson Kennedy and how they develop an oral history and folklore practice during a time of rising fascism in the 1930s, the point again is to allow the most powerless people to speak and to listen to what they say. Because heaven knows, if you listen to, you know, God love, love NPR, but, but if you listen to NPR, if you listen to CNN or listen to these others, um, you're generally not going to hear poor people speak. You hear experts speak. You hear advocates speak. But that's not what Hurston and Kennedy were, were, were trying to do. Uh, and I'm not saying, you know, there's not, nothing necessarily wrong with being an advocate, but I think trying to build a democratic society, the goal is to kind of eliminate the need for advocates and help people become their own advocates. And there's so many other things I could say, but I think I'll go ahead and stop for now because I'm looking at the clock and I think stopping right on time. So thank you for your patience. Be happy to take questions. Yes. Hi, you remember me from yesterday. I remember you. Yes. Well, you see, I come from the Rockaways, like the right stuff, the western part of the Rockaways, you know, and and they are more right wing leaning than, let's say, the parts of Brooklyn and Queens or the eastern side of the Rockaways. So, I was thinking. What I, what I said about, about what Hurston and Kennedy said, do you, I, I feel like I have a feeling that my, my 
my community is going down that rabbit hole because I, you know, I see Trump flags everywhere in this community. Wow, one of the flags out of this is a liberal free zone. So, what do you do? You think that's do you think that's a going to be a problem with my community? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think, I mean, look, I have more than a few very hardcore Trump supporters in my Mexican American elder community in in, in Texas. Uh, oh yes. Oh yes, they are everywhere. And and to me though, that's not a problem. That's not the problem. These are simply people who vote differently. Um, but s some of them are really good parents, you know, good uncles, good aunts. Um, but they are they're mega people, and I have them in my family. Um, I'm not going to like outcast them or anything. I'm, now I am going to talk with them and tell them like where I'm coming from. Um, but if you knew some of my uncles who are like like building contractor type of people, and you try to argue with them about things like wages and stuff, I mean that's one time I remember my father came to visit, and um, we went out. We were gathering petitions to raise a minimum wage in Florida, a campaign which actually won eventually. And we got my dad is a great canvasser. He ta he loves talking to people. You know, he's just a wonderful look kind of, what's that old phrase you use? Lugubrious. I love using that term. Very, very outgoing. And we got back from getting a lot of petitions signed, and my Uncle Leonard called just to check in and see what was, and Leonard is a heating and air conditioning contractor. And the funny thing for a Mexican-American business person is that at one point he actually had the heating and air conditioning contract in San Antonio for the Alamo. We used to give him, you say, Uncle Leonard, you're the kind of uh, Hispanic. You probably would have joined the Anglos during the Battle of the Alamo. And he used to get so angry at us, right? So angry. But, you know, he, he's, a, he's a kind of, a, you know, I, I know he voted for Trump. I didn't ask him, but I'm, I'm pretty sure he voted for Trump. So he asked my father, his brother, uh, Pablo, what, what were you guys doing? And my dad, I'm like, Dad, don't say it, don't say it. My dad said, oh, we were, we're getting petitions signed to raise minimum wage. I'm like, Dad, why? So that led to a 30-minute conversation. It was actually a really good conversation. We didn't change Uncle Leonard's mind because his thing was, well, you know, um, he just disagreed with us. And that's cool. It's cool to have disagreements. That's fine. It's when those disagreements, um, when someone, you know, imposes their will and makes you powerless, that's, that's not fine. You know, so I think it's perfectly fine to have Trump supporters in your community because I have them in my family and, you know, we, we, we still get along and we argue, but um, that's pluralism. What's not okay, and I will be talking about this on Thursday, is efforts to rob people of the right to vote who don't share your opinions and then to use the institutions of the society to try to stop them from doing things like forming trade unions, like like having the right to control their own bodies. That is what is wrong. You know, have your opinion. What did they used to say back in the day? You know, that and a buck fifty will get you a ticket to the New York subway. I don't think it's that works anymore. But <laughs> sorry for that. I kind of I went on and on, but um, I'll try to be more concise. Other question. So you talk a lot about uh, like interviewing, um, especially laborers and working class people, and a lot of people say like you know like time is money. So when you're um, interviewing these people, or when oral historians are talking to these people, especially earlier, like in the twenties and thirties, how are these laborers usually compensated or um, rewarded in a way for their time, or are they not like because yeah. a lot of these people they don't have. The, their mind is not in like, oh, I'm going to go listen to this archive or to this oral history. Usually, they're probably not even going to hear their playback. So how do you kind of handle that situation? Yeah, it's a really good question. So how are people compensated for being interviewed or participating in a research project? 
And this is why you should join the Oral History Association, because we have this kind of conversation all the time. I mean, some of our projects now are calibrated to where that that financial element is actually factored into the project. Um, obviously, for a class, you're not going to, I don't think that your professor is giving you a budget to, to pay people. Um, but it's something we have to be cognizant of. What is it that, and, and let me kind of zoom out from the question, what is it that we're getting out of the interview and the research versus what our narrators are getting? And that this is a topic we talk about all the time, in, and I'm sure you've been talking about it uh, if you're in if you're taking oral history courses, because um, I think academics don't spend enough time talking about that. You know, look, if you're a grad student doing field work, you may be a little better off than the people you're interviewing, depending on what your your financial. If you're a first gen student or not, you know, you may not be. In other words. You may not be, you likely will not be in a situation where you actually can actually pay someone to do an interview. But you can think about, you can ask them, well, what, you know, what do you want out of this? Um, I found many times that people really want their perspectives aired and they tell me very clearly, I expect you to share my perspective, to tell the truth about what's really happening in the society from my vantage point. And for some people, that's really the payment that they're looking for. I remember when I first started doing field work in Florida in 1994, it was the summer after the Rosewood compensation hearings. Rosewood was one of many horrific anti-black massacres, anti-black pogroms in this country that usually go unheard of or untalked about. It's just that that spring, the survivors of some of the survivors of, Rose, of the Rosewood massacre of 1923 got together and gave their told their stories in front of the state legislature. It was just a remarkable moment to be a historian. And so I was in Florida the summer after that happened. And when I would talk to white academics, they would say to the last of them, well, Paul, other than Rosewood, Florida was a very moderate state in terms of race relations. Jim Crow just wasn't as bad here. Um, and but when I would interview African-American elders, they'd say, who told you that? Florida was worse than Georgia, worse than Mississippi. And we didn't move to those places because why? It wouldn't have improved our lives marginally. And so the thing that they, that that cohort of people I was interviewing, people I've written about, people like Laura Dixie or Sam Dixie or um, the Uncle A.I. Dixie that I talk about in Emancipation Betrayed, they wanted me to tell the truth, and that was their payoff uh, in, in, in many ways. And they were like, we, and, and they followed me, and they expected me to tell the truth. The first book talk I gave for Emancipation Betrayed, by the way, was at their house. And uh, it was just really an incredible experience. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question for you would be, how would you navigate sensitive or emotional topics during an oral history interview? Oral history uh, can be tough because it isn't like, and we, we talked a little bit about this yesterday and the day before, it isn't like being in a classroom where you can kind of manage and, and create the safe space uh, for people and, and create it, you know, the things we talk about as faculty and as students, as instructors and as lifelong learners is you know, inclusivity, welcoming, diversity. But again, when you're out in the field, um, all bets are off. And you can be in a situation, you can find yourself in a situation really quickly where you are talking to someone who says something that is just so awful, you, your heart just falls out. I mean, let, let me give you one example. So <clears throat> I was interviewing the former lieutenant governor of the state of Florida, whose name I honestly can't recall. Now that I turned 60, I can use the senior moment. <laughs> um, Wayne, oh, anyway, he was lieutenant governor under Bob Graham. And this interview is actually in our archive at the University of Florida, so you can actually listen to it. And we're in the middle of doing this interview. He had a fascinating life. Wayne, is it Wayne Mixon? I think Wayne Mixon. And... Um, at a certain point, 
after Governor Graham matriculated to become a U.S. Senator from Florida, uh, President Jimmy Carter appointed Lieutenant Governor Mixon to be a diplomat in Latin America. And, and I knew this. But in the middle of this interview, he stops and he looks at me and he says, you know, Paul, uh, I just want to kind of clear the air here. Uh, I knew Augusto Pinochet and he was actually a really good man. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. I mean, I knew people, I, I have colleagues who lost family members in the Chilean uh, 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 dictatorship under Pinochet and whose, whose deaths he had ordered. And I was just like, you know, how do I deal with this? I was so stunned that I just didn't really say anything. And I just kind of let him talk more. I mean, another instance, so in other words, I'm not going to answer your question. I'm just going to give you a couple scenarios. Another one was <clears throat> I got a call <clears throat> one evening <clears throat> from a, a person who said that he had served in special forces with me in Central America. I didn't know this man. He identified himself as a Cuban-American former special forces soldier, and but he insisted we work together. Now, what happened, What what how we got together, how he called me was he was dying of cancer. He had pancreatic cancer, and he was he had a, a corner suite in a Miami-Dade uh, Veterans Hospital. And he wanted me to come down and, and get some of his life story. And, and again, the premise was we had worked together in Colombia. And <clears throat> I said, well, sir, I just don't, I don't remember that. I don't remember your name. Um, and, but the only way I'm going to come in and interview you is it's got to be public. You have to agree that the interview is going to be deposited at the University of Florida Public Archive, because otherwise it's just a bunch of old war veterans talking, and that's you know a buck fifty, right? So <clears throat> I went down to talk with him, and you know in the first five minutes of the interview, after he had kind of checked me out and everything, and um, he said, you know. <clears throat> He talked about why he had stopped working in Colombia. And he said, Paul, you know, I grew up as a right wing uh, Cuban immigrant. Well, actually, he was he was uh, raised mainly in Spain. Uh, his family had left after, shortly after the Cuban Revolution, maybe a little before the Cuban Revolution for Spain. That was a pretty common story, 1958 to 1959. And he had been in an operation where he was sent to Colombia to um, abduct Cuban Marxist um, special forces soldiers who were trained the, the Colombian Marxist insurgency, which was very strong at that time. And they would kidnap these individuals, and as a Cuban, he was supposed to be able to identify Cubans. Now, how this really worked in practice, he couldn't quite explain himself. But they did abduct some Cuban um, uh, military advisors who were in the highlands of, in Colombia. And they would take them up in airplanes and they would torture them. And while they were still alive, they would drop them from 10, about eight to 10,000 feet. Okay. So again, you know, the kind of narrative, the kind of story that's just heartbreaking and how on earth, I mean, I just, I mean, I, I, you know, was it disturbing? Oh my God, yes. But again, I thought, you've got to get this story down. People have got to hear this because this is what war is. War is ugly. War is, yes, genocide. War is the crime. And there is no way to fight a war <laughs> that is supportive of human rights. That is impossible. And so this kind of story, I felt, really had to get out there. But, uh, oh, it's my phone, by the way. <laughs> At least I have it on me. <laughs> um, and, I, and again, I'm not giving you a straight answer, but I'm just saying that, in my experience, there are just a lot of stories that really need to be told, but they're tough stories. And we, we just have to be there to hear those stories. I, I think. Um, Thank you for your insight. Okay. Thank you. Given 
given that technology is advanced, uh, how has AI impacted like oral history? Like, does it cause problems, and do you see any foreseeable issues? I think AI right now, you know, it's it's I think a double-edged sword, and we use AI. I mean, l let me give you a, a, the best case scenario for, for how AI is being used positively in the oral history world. So the National Endowment for Humanities has funded uh, our oral history program at UF to uh, improve machine language and processing. And so I had colleagues who came to me about four or five years ago and they said, Paul, um, we want to use oral history to make machine language processing, which is the, the corollary to like visual recognition. We want to try to make machine language processing less racist. Um, do you have recorded voices of African Americans and other people of color that we can use to, to help do that? I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. So we've been working with our colleagues. This is interdisciplinary. I would never know how to do this. Our linguistic folks know how to do this because they work with like the visual and machine language and essentially it's audio recognition, okay? And so that's, that's becoming a fairly common kind of project and we're, we're very strategically based because we've been gathering voices for generations. And again, it goes back to Hurston and back to Kennedy. I mean, they weren't necessarily recording most of that back then, but now we have enough of an archive to where if you come to us and say, Hey, we need voices from people from from uh, Afro-Caribbeans who migrated to Florida in the 1980s to make machine language processing more inclusive. We have those narratives now, like like recorded. Uh, so I'm just going to give you the positive side of AI because I feel positive. But yeah, that that's one example of the technology. Now, unfortunately, as an administrator, I've fallen so far behind the technology that all I can do is just kind of generally describe it. I just generally like direct people to go out and do interviews, but I'm looking forward to a time where I can actually get back into the more of the technology. So. Thank you, we are out of time, but I wanted to first thank the students for your insightful questions, thoughtful questions, so thank you. And then Paul, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. We'll see you the next time right here at the time. Bye-bye, thank you. All right.